Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and so much for struggling through the traffic tonight. Today, I hope to give you something new, um, not completely new, but a bit new. And as Sharmila just said, um, when I'm asked to give talks on Vivekananda in Britain or the United States, I generally have to start off by saying who he was and then go on to talk about why he's important. It's simply wonderful not to have to do that throat clearing. Um, but the underlying question remains nonetheless. The argument in my book is that Vivekananda must and should be seen as one of the seminal figures of the global 19th century. But the pattern of his fame does not in any way match that of his influence. Here, he's in a household name. In the West, very few have even heard of him. Why this is the case goes to the heart of his life, his ideas, and his program. Today, I want to understand why such different publics as respectable New Englanders and Swadeshi terrorists honored him so fervently. With the title of my book, Guru to the World, I did not want to reinforce the tired story of Vivekananda as the first global guru who unlocked Eastern spirituality for the materialist West. Although I chose the title deliberately, I wanted to query this view rather than reinforce it. I too want to talk about Vivekananda's relationship to Hinduism, nationalism, anti-colonialism, and karma yoga, the usual things, but depart from the constraining vision of him as a Hindu revivalist. Instead, I want to combine the Indian Vivekananda with the global guru that Westerners, and many Indians as well, came to venerate as the epitome of Indian spirituality, tolerance, and universalism. What's important to me is that there is only one man, a figure endlessly responding to circumstance and milieu and reacting on the hoof to different audiences. This is not some philosopher or theologian in an ivory tower. He's moving, he's, on, he's traveling, he's trying to connect. I will not be talking about Vivekananda and his important to present day India. Instead, I hope to bring to life the late 19th century world that he inhabited. It's hard now to recapture, to imagine the currents of fantasy ecla globalism when Boston ladies in their drawing rooms read Max Muller's Sacred Books of the East and educated Calcuttans read the American transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson, something, by the way, that Vivekananda had read, and eminent scientists all over the world took spiritualism seriously. Science, religion, and the occult swirled in eddies that flowed into one another, and the conversations they provoked were all the more interesting and sometimes trenchant because of surging anti-colonialism. Above all, Vivekananda and his audiences everywhere envisage India through the Orientalist distinction between Eastern spirituality and Western materialism, the latter on extravagant display at America's Columbia Exposition. And there it is, a hodgepodge of neoclassical, monumental, canals, Venice, the only country, the only place, uh, the only country that was non-Western in the center of the island was the Japanese Huden. Such views meant that Vivekananda had to fight against stereotypes and prejudices, but these very oppositions permitted his entry into American and British circles as he deployed them to insist on India's unique importance for global culture. I want to show the paradox of how he asserted the value of different universalisms to those promulgated in the West, and to suggest that they were almost as various as the diversity that he treasured as central to India. The paradox remains that he had to often insert himself into the straitjacket of Orientalism. He did not come up with a seamless philosophy or system, far from it. Instead, he challenged Western hegemony and attempted to make people, both in India and the West, think outside the box. In the 1890s, he articulated a powerful critique of the claims of Christianity to be the sole religion of redemption, 
and did so before a Christian audience, while also rejecting atheist claims that science would replace spirituality. Let's take his famous appearance at the World Parliament of Religion in Chicago in 1893. He takes the podium and in every way rejects the stereotypes of both Indians and Westerners by not looking like anybody they have ever seen. The scarlet tunic and orange turban meant he resembled neither the wandering sadhu of Orientalist imaginings, nor the Western Christian minister in somber, somber black with white collar. Rather than being grateful be, for being allowed to speak at all, he addressed his audience as sisters and brothers, not as masters. He does not see Jesus as the only path to salvation, although he readily accepts Christ as an avatar. He proclaims instead, we believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions to be true. Words bearing and character all rejected what he regarded as Western fanaticism and the hegemony it claimed. Strangely, Vivekananda's remarks were greeted with wild applause. Why? That was the main question of the book. Somehow, he tapped into a vein of self-criticism, doubt, and vulnerability within his Western hearers. Witnesses remembered the thrill they experienced when he said that it was, quote, a sin to call you sinners, and then went on to attack Christian notions of original sin and hellfire. His words fell on fertile soil as he spoke to Americans' growing rejection of a punitive God and re reconsidered their childhood relationship to the Bible as literal truth. Vivekananda's words, however, did not shift the views of Orthodox Christians. For them, Indians were heathens who worshiped idols, and he reacted badly when more than once women asked if Indian mothers threw their babies to crocodiles. If they were not heathens, then Indians were metaphysicians taken up with a nihilistic transcendental search. More than once, Vivekananda was described as Jesuitical, a, a term that referred to the intellectual counter-reformation priests of Europe to suggest a deceptive, if not brilliant, sophistry. Even the famous American philosopher and psychologist, William James, whom I'll speak about more, said that Hinduism was ultimately nothing more than a, what he called a, a sumptuosity of security. Vivekananda, who had engaged with James, resisted this cliche about characterless Indians incapable of dealing with real world problems. Such remarks perhaps explains why he insisted on practical Vedanta. At worst, Westerners wanted a yogi who could perform magical tricks, not dissimilar to the Indian snake charmers of American vaudeville theaters. It makes it easier to understand why in Raja Yoga, the first manual of yoga to be published in India, he concentrated on mental states rather than on, quote, getting occult powers. He deployed his knowledge provocatively by arguing against the separation between religion and science. This important and novel contribution not only rejected Christian exclusivism, but also the universalist claims of European ration rationalism and the Enlightenment. He welcomed scientific discoveries, especially evolution, about which he wrote quite extensively, thermodynamics and germ theory, but believed they would confirm ancient Indian spiritual and cosmological truths and become, in the end, handmaidens to Vedanta. It seems to me, he said, that the conclusions of modern science are the very conclusions that Vedanta reached ages ago. But in modern science, they are written in the language of matter. He asserted that processes of creation and destruction outlined in evolution were already present in the laws of karma. As you know, Darwin had argued that in any given population, those slightly better adapted to an environment would succeed more in reproducing. Vivekananda accepted evolution, but not this idea of natural selection, especially for the higher reaches of human thought and morality. He was in good company, 
Even the co-discoverer of evolutionary theory, Alfred Russell Wallace, maintained that natural selection did not operate in such areas. I think it's important to realize that Vivekananda is following these debates and is engaged with them at the highest level. In, what, in rejecting what became social Darwinism, Vivekananda also rejected colonialism and realized that Western science could be used to beat Indians for failing to measure up to European standards in the same way that Christianity was deployed. He wrote that the survival of the fittest had, quote, furnished every oppressor with an argument to calm the qualms of conscience. He knew very well that these were exactly the arguments that were made by imperialists all over the world. Instead, he turned to Patanjali, who had explained that the, quote, true secret of evolution is the manifestation of perfection, which is already in every being. Such statements appealed to his Western followers who warmed to the idea of the essential self or the authentic self as being in tune with their own transcendental ideas. In London, he once said that if a man quotes a Moses or a Buddha or a Christ, he is laughed at, but let him give the name of Huxley or a Darwin and it is swallowed without salt. With rare insight, he saw that scientific debate could be as full of metaphor, bias, and unacknowledged prejudice as controversies in religion. And I think these, these remarks especially were very brave and showed his, his ability to engage in intellectual debates that were deemed beyond Indians. Science for him was a vital part of the synthesis he created, but it was not an end in itself. He furthered this belief when he pressed Sister Nivedita to work with J.C. Bose to create what they called Vedantic science. And if you're interested in that, I have quite a bit on it in the book. Above all, however, he dwelled on experience. This was the buzzword of the moment, the notion that served as a bridge between him and his Western audience. They had rejected both conventional Christianity and the rationalist certainties of positivism in favor of what they called the new sciences of mind, emerging in especially psychology and anthropology. And they turned to Vivekananda for insights on perception, states of meditation, and what he deftly called superconsciousness. The people he dealt with were often alternative and avant-garde, and they listened when Vivekananda argued that modern science reinforced the ancient wisdom of India, and when he insisted that Indian spirituality promoted an experimental template for religious and spiritual universalism. Naturally, they saw his ideas through their own spiritual lens. Here we see Vivekananda, Um, at Greenacre, Maine, where they studied new ideas and practices and where he studied them. I don't know how many of you have seen this photograph, but it's one of my favorites. As usual, he's, he's, he's unmissable. He's wearing his turban, but here he's unmissable because he's with people who are so unlike him. This is a group of highly educated New England Yankees. While there, he saw about theosophy, which he had criticized but knew about, and he was intrigued by Christian science, the idea that humanity's suffering was nothing more than waking dream shadows, a description strikingly like the Maya of Vedanta. Now we see what the vision of Christian science. There's the founder of Christian science. Her name is Mary Baker Eddy. This is one of the greatest um, religious revolutions in America at the end of the 19th century. And she claimed that the idea of egos in different bodies was just an illusion and that people could, like Jesus exiting the tomb, be resurrected. Christian scientists, even today, refuse medical help. And you see in the background a woman praying. Vivekananda didn't like this. He thought there was interference. But he was also, he knew that his greatest audience in America were often Christian scientists. All his major female collaborators 
had, had started as Christian scientists or had gone to Christian science before they came to him. He listened to spiritualist lectures, learned their views on comparative religion, and watched them perform healings. On the whole, he wasn't very impressed, and he found them spiritually dry, which is a wonderful word, and physically brittle, though he admired their virtue. The physical, physical brittleness is interesting. He talked about the women who didn't even give up their corsets when they went sea bathing. And for this reason, he proceeded to give lessons in yoga under the so-called Swami's Pine, where he hoped to bring both spiritual insight and physical flexibility. I think from the very beginning, it's important to understand that when he looked at the people he was working with, he was interested in embodiment as much as the highest flights of Hindu thought. Experience was so important to Vivekananda and his audiences, both abroad and in India, because it shifted attention away from textual study and intellect to the more personal and immediate connections to the divine. It was central to the semi-literate Ramakrishna, who had prioritized his mystical experience over sacred texts. And in the way William James emphasized it in his groundbreaking Varieties of Religious Experience, published in 1902, the year Vivekananda died, in which Vivekananda is cited several times. It has become one of the classic texts of mystical psychology. By emphasizing experience, both sides underscored their inner worlds, subjective understandings, and embodied awareness. Their view of religious experience, however, was very different despite this common terrain. Vivekananda spoke of Advaita, of the paradox of self and non-self that had a long and venerated metaphysical pedigree in India but which his audience had difficulty understanding. Nonetheless, in both the East and West, Vivekananda as well as, well as the Westerners with whom he sparred, be they Harvard professors or theosophists, argued that the subject was not a free will agent of the dualism of Descartes, but one that recognized that experience signified possibilities beyond the realm of objects and rational deduction. In my view, this intuition may explain why feminine experience was often central to apprehending what was deemed beyond the masculine domain of reason. William James, for example, had recourse to female mediums in his research. And here he is with someone who ultimately was considered one of the greatest frauds of the end of the 19th century, Usapia Palladino, a famous Italian medium. But it was important also for Vivekananda, who acknowledged women's spiritual power. Now, his reliance on women demands a reassessment of many things, but in my view, especially what Western historians have called the feminization of religion in the 19th century. The term conjures up the armies of Christian female missionaries who worked at home in the, in the colonies. Vivekananda inverted the normal alliances with Western women opposing Christian missionaries and even becoming anti-imperialists, while Indian female figures became the new saints of the movement. I will say more in a few minutes about Sharada Devi. Connections with women were crucial for the way Vivekananda internationalized his enterprise. To succeed, he needed to put the world of Western act activists and alternative spirituality together with Hindu wifehood, motherhood, and female safe sainthood. These aims were often profoundly contradictory, and later he was troubled that he could not find reliable Western men to support his efforts. And if you want to know why, I can explain that perhaps in the Q&A. Nonetheless, these women were crucial to creating worldwide Vedanta, and central to promoting a vision of India as the world's spiritual teacher, a notion which still has tremendous force today in India. The relationship of Vivekananda to this women's world was crucial to his changing view of Hinduism. The stories are legendary. Early on in India, he was reluctant to undertake new ventures without the support of Ramakrishna's widow, Sharada Devi, requiring her permission before leaving for America. 
He learned about American religion from women and was struck by their moral and intellectual independence, even if later he became more critical. He was welcomed into the unusual world of highly educated Yankee ladies, which included novelists, female lecturers and reformers, women with old Puritan pedigrees, often substantial wealth, and links to Harvard academics and New England theologians. And here we see Sarah Bull's um, calm mother, Sarah Bull, and without her, many of the buildings at Belor Mat would never have been constructed. Even though they had fantasies about the Orient, for most, Vivekananda was their first encounter with a real South Asian. They were astonished by his beauty, intelligence, and wit, and overwhelmed him with curiosity and hospitality. His celibacy enabled a rare social intimacy, which also paradoxically reinforced an image of manly restraint, so important to his self-vision as a renouncer. Although the sexual boundary was observed, at times distressing emotional entanglements resulted in hurt in both sides. And it's very interesting to see these letters, uh, both from Vivekananda and from the women, in a world where there is no guru-disciple relationship yet, and where he's trying to build it. And they are both dealing with questions of how to create it in a different culture. Above all, and in deliberate contrast to Christian missionaries, he sought no converts. He created Vedanta societies for sure, but he also said famously that the method, he only wanted to make a Methodist a better Methodist, the Presbyterian a better Presbyterian, the Unitarian a better Unitarian. And he, by doing so, he sought to exemplify the tolerance that for him was the essence of Hinduism, describing India's welcome of Jews after the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem and the embrace of fleeing Zoroastrians. This, this example of the Jews was particularly important to him because he was very aware of Western anti-Semitism. He therefore presented so-called spiritual India at the parliament as the eternal refuge, a portrayal which set aside growing intercommunal rivalry between Hindus and Muslims, as well as the whole question of untouchability. He sidestepped Pandita Ramabai's concern for the unhappy state of Hindu women, afraid, afraid that her critiques would diminish Indi Indians. Because of British power, he remained always on the defensive. His discourse on tolerance, a word he really did not like, revealed another dimension of an essentialized Hinduism that was internationalized, but also vital to his national vision. This, I suggest, is the profound paradox of claiming to be the guru to the world, which is why I, I titled the book in this way. Above all, contrary to the man-making stereotype in India, in America, he said, quote, I am a woman amongst women. And he and the woman he associated with experimented the, with these new relationships in ways that were both life-enhancing and disruptive. He remarked in 1897 when he returned to India, if I have to come back again as a woman, I must and will come back as an American woman. <laughs> he compared their, which is not what we would expect from Vivekananda. He compared their freedoms to the constraints that ruled Indian women, whose condition had been at the center of both reformist and orthodox debate over westernization for decades. But it was still very difficult for him. He acknowledged women, American women's moral force despite his ambivalence over their philanthropy and activism, which he continued to fear would, might be directed at his fellow Indians in a way that would cause dependence. He remained wary of co coercive Western emancipation, especially for Indian women. Although violently opposed to child marriage, he was cautious on the subject of widowry marriage, which he regarded as a spiritual death. I truly believe that Vivekananda could not envisage his mother, who was a widow, remarrying. Brides, he continued to believe, should be subordinate to the son's mother until they became mothers in term, and he said so loudly during a lecture in no place other than California. 
He also had an exalted view of Sharada Devi, and she was key to how he envisaged the maternal in his theology. But she was, above all, a living spiritual guide. Now, the problem with Sharada Devi is we never have her words. We only have witnesses' accounts. But we know that she made a tremendous impression on people. When he returned to India for the first time in 1897, he washed himself in the Ganges before meeting her so as not to contaminate her with foreign corruption. Ordinarily, he derided such rituals as don't touch them, but with her, he readily cast aside his cloak of enlightenment in search for the proper purification. Sharada became paramount in his mission because at least in his eyes, she seemed able to square the circle, to be the ideal Hindu woman while also resisting convention, first by continuing to wear her wedding bangles and red-boarded sari as a widow, and later by sharing food with his foreign female devotees. And there she is with Sharada Devi. And there's a long discussion about her willingness to come and welcome them. Despite the many constraints placed on Brahmin widows, she was everywhere. She apparently attacked a mischievous disciple who slapped uh, uh, by slapping him and holding his thumb. No, it's the opposite. When she was attacked by a mischievous disciple, she apparently slapped him and held his tongue to make him stop. She continued to help sex workers against Ramakrishna's advice and believed she honored him by using her own judgment. Indeed, time and again, she told the Western women that that's what surrender to the guru meant. Vivekananda never used those words. And her husband died, and after her husband died, she traveled far and wide, counted the poor and mighty, and cooked endlessly for each disciple, tailoring each dish to the monk's physiological makeup and preference. Of course, the last service was also a metaphor for, for spiritual progress. Each person needed to find a religious path suitable to his or her spiritual constitution. These stories were told again and again in the hagiographies to show how Sarah Devi was, Sharada Devi was esteemed for her practical application of this understanding. He was devoted to her and regarded her as a saint that he would never become. But there is no doubt that he was caught out by the very idealizations that he created because he required many different kinds of workers. And he found another ideal and created another ideal with Margaret Noble, the Scotch-Irish woman he called his Celtic lioness, who met him in London and followed him back to Calcutta. There she Hinduized herself and connected with other global intellectuals. While he and Tagore never met, she did associate with Tagore, the Japanese art historian and Pan-Asianist Okakura Kakutso, and of course, J.C. Bose. Vivekananda christened her the dedicated one, and she undertook the task both of articulating his world significance and embedding aspects of his theology into a nascent Indian nationalism. Perhaps more than Vivekananda, she pushed for the Indian national idea. Often, especially while in the West, he argued against nationalism, against the survival of the fittest, as I've explained. And when she first came to India, Nivedita suggested that she was, quote, the most loyal English woman that ever breathed. After she said that, he railed at her and called such attachment a sin. In fact, he made her cry often when she expressed herself in this, what he thought, imperialist way. Other times, however, he, he, his talk of the sacred motherland suggested that he shared this dangerous love of country. She believed that he exemplified the national idea but was not its spokesman or theoretician, a role that she sought for herself. It is true that, although he spoke often of man-making and the kshatriya force, she, not he, developed these ideas after his death in a 1905 pamphlet called Aggressive Hinduism, published during Swadeshi. For Vivekananda, she was his best in the making, and she reshaped his message when he re-embraced re Kali worship in 1898 on a, a pilgrimage to Kirbawani in the Himalayas. 
He famously wrote a poem about the goddess and discussed Kali's infinite darkness, power for destruction, and love of madness. When he returned, he withdrew and was no longer interested in, quote, doing good. He even told Nivedita that patriotism was a mistake. I have more to say about Nivedita's fear of this non-self uh, that Vivekananda embraced at this crucial moment of his life. For now, I'll suggest that her incomprehension was later transformed into a deep appreciation of Kali's power. And again, if you want to discuss it in the Q&A, it's hard for perhaps Indians to understand what it was like for Christians used to a patriarchal god who did not worship the Virgin because they were Protestants to encounter Kali. Uh, the, she became the goddess's foremost Western advocate and later the books and lectures, um, it seems, were done in collaboration with Vivekananda. But later there were suggestions that she rewrite some of it and she refused unless Vivekananda personally ordered her to do so. He never did. Vivekananda was savvy in finding a forward-looking British woman of education to present Kali's case. Kali worshipped horrified the Brahmos and Westerners equally, with such devotion seen as revealing the perceived lower levels of Hindu worship. She confronted this head-on. She even went to Kaligat, where goats are sacrificed, and where she stated that, quote, the great glory of this mother worship lies in its bestowal of manhood. For men like Aurobindo and Pippin Chandrapal, her book recast Kali from being a symbol of national degeneration into an icon of national dynamism. They thought it her greatest contribution. And now I'd like to come to the last part of my lecture and to, talk, to revert to the question of the two Vivekanandas. At first glance, it does seem that his message altered according to his audience. In the West, he emphasized universality, uh, insisting that Christians recognize the world's diversities. In India, he was apparently concerned with the Gita and the biceps, a statement that in fact he made only once, even though it became the rubric by which he is almost inevitably condemned or applauded today. Even if we set aside such stereotypes, he did repeat the man-making message to his monks and in many other Indian settings. Was he then, in the end, like the Buddha, who used skillful speech to speak differently to different publics? Ordinarily, when people talk about the Buddha and Vivekananda, they trace metaphysical and spiritual connections. But in a conversation with the novelist Kirthik Sasidharan, I began to think about the Buddha's impact in a different way. Vivekananda seemed to employ the Buddha's method of skillful speech to draw people away from extremes. Certainly, in the West, he preached against materialism, violence, and fanaticism, his national pride focusing on Indian tolerance and inclusion. He sought to introduce yoga to draw Westerners away from muscular Christianity, from what he perceived as the hardness of their minds and bodies. Against Western brutality, he hoped to teach mildness, Against the busyness of Western commercialism and punctuality, he asserted the primacy of meditation and explained that processes of concentration were not ends but means. Unlike Christian scientists, he did not seek miraculous cure, but advised it said instead perseverance and endurance in the search for transcendence. And to achieve his ends, he scolded a habit which the Western women found hard to bear. He was not sensitive to the gender dynamics of their interaction. But he also criticized what he saw as Western chivalry as a form of sex that hampered women's strength. As much as amongst Indian men, he sought to promote robustness among his female acolytes, though he did not call it man-making. Indeed, the inability to find other words shows the stereotype's deep-rootedness. But besides the scolding, he also encouraged and, above all, listened. Despite his socially conservative view of women, he surprised them by his attentiveness. 
They were stunned that he actually ground spices and made curries for them. They had never had a man cook for them. His often traditional statements about women did not preclude a vision of their spiritual importance or their genuine interest in their religious and effective lives. So if this was his technique in the West, in India he preached otherwise. His nationalism expressed differently. He wanted to end what he saw as Indian timidity, to shift attitudes of subservience and fear, and above all, to resist imitation. When young and traveling across the breadth and length of India, he took two books, the Gita, of course, and The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, a 15th century text that urged Christians to withdraw for the world in search of spiritual growth. He loved this book and, talk, and, and taught it to everyone he could, um, and, but he also loved it because it ind indicted the arrogance of British missionaries in his own time. But later he became more ambivalent about imitation and its suggestion of colonial inferiority, the desire to imitate those um, who were the conquerors. When, for example, he came to the World Parliament, he advocated universalism, but also self-respecting differentiation. He said, the Christian is not to become a Hindu or a Buddhist, nor a Hindu or a Buddhist to become a Christian, but each must assimilate the spirit of the others and yet preserve his individuality. In my view, he was laboring to understand how one changed while remaining oneself, an existential concern that he returned to throughout his life. Such issues, of course, were profoundly personal, but also cultural and political. How did a people or a nation alter itself or find new sources of strength without surrendering its values and identity? He wondered as early as 1894 if Indians could become Occidental in energy activism and equality while remaining Hindu in religion. But by religion, he meant not just spiritual concerns, but also cultural values. How could India remain open to the world without losing itself in harmful Western ideas? How were Indians, both as individuals and as a nation, to realize themselves? He proclaimed in California in 1900, religion is not an imitation of Jesus or Mohammed. Imitation is never genuine. Be not an imitation of Jesus, but be Jesus. You are quite as great as Jesus, Buddha, or anybody else. And such skillful speech was part of the pulling and prodding his audiences to the middle, away from the extremes that hampered them. I have suggested that he taught meditation to urge Westerners away from busyness, distraction, and hardness. However, when he returned to India, he constrained his, the spontaneity of his guru brothers and with new routines and regulations. In Belarmat, he introduced the Delsart method, a system of breath control and expression exercise pioneered by French singing and acting coach. Francois Delsart. I think this is remarkable because he had mar mocked this method while in the West, advocating instead a control of the pranayama and criticizing the divas. Vivekananda was a famous singer. and He knew a lot of actresses and singers in the West, including Sarah Bernhardt. Um, and uh, in addition to the Delsart, they had to start training with dumbbells to deepen the physical endurance of, that was necessary for practical Vedanta. So he, he turned this all around and brought the West back to Bellarmat. This takes us to what in India is regarded as the core of his teaching, practical Vedanta and karma yoga. He, put, he deployed them in a way that fought against the Western stereotypes of Indians as natural metaphysicians, an argument that the British made to deprive Indians especially of higher education in science. Practical Vedanta, in my view, emerged hand in hand with his hatred of what he called don't touchism. Speaking of the endless ceremonials, food prohibitions, and bans against caste intermar intermarriage and dining, he concluded, those whose heads have a tendency to be troubled day and night over such questions 
simply deserve the name of wretches. He argued against, quote, the fictitious differentiation between religion and the life of the world, and in the process reshaped Advaita Vedanta. For Vivekananda, Advaita proposed unity and solidarity among all human beings, a worship of the divine within, a vision of universality and connection that had so seduced his Western hearers. Even today, his vision of Advaita Vedanta may offend the Orthodox, while some might perceive his practical Vedanta as a betrayal of Ramakrishna, who had warned against philanthropists' worldly desire for so-called name and fame. He even had to shift the attitudes of his beloved brother disciples, who remained distressed at handling money and writing official reports for publication of their efforts to feed the famine-stricken. But he persisted and their dedication became a model for this new kind of service. Remember, he gave his famous London lectures on practical Vedanta before his return to India in 1897, in the midst of the horrible hunger that killed 12 million Indians. It, the, the famine shook him to the core. His view of Vaita Vedanta also helped him envisage the nation. During his return tour in 1897, he spoke about in-university and how unity could be only be achieved by celebrating the mosaic of cultures and religions that comprised India. He never worried about so-called racial mixing, nor did he ever suggest segregation. He prioritized Advaita for metaphysical reasons, but also because he disliked sectarianism. He, he proclaimed, one sect has one particular form of ritual and thinks that it's holy, while rituals of another are simply arrant superstition. Advaita, by emphasizing formlessness, asserted that unity existed above particularity. This was vital to India precisely because of its diversity. He said, here have been the Aryan, the Dravidian, the Tartar, the Turk, the Mughal, the European, all the nations of the world pouring their blood into this land. He recognized that language, race, or ethnicity could not bring Indians together. Instead, he emphasized, admittedly, a Hindu vision of Advaitic unity that encouraged all spiritual inclinations to find shelter under its capacious umbrella. This is what I think he meant when he extolled, quote, our sacred religion, our religion as the one common ground. He openly acknowledged enmity between Hindu and Muslim brothers, but also believed that fraternity would and should outweigh rivalry and antipathy. Of course, this vision of Advaita prioritized a Hindu idea, a notion of embrace and connection that non-Hindus might resist. His karma yoga was an explicit program of national rejuvenation that steered between reformist meliorism and reactionary revivalism. He also focused on compassionate and disinterested activism. He wanted the renouncer to retain the otherworldly subjectivity of yore, but now to tackle India's contemporary problems. The Sanyasin, he maintained, was ideally suited to join in life's endless flux while retaining inner stillness. However, the transcendent and the mundane were no longer meant to oppose one another. He also encouraged these ideals amongst householders, but I will end by exploring the suggestion of militancy in his thought. When after his pilgrimage in Kirbawani, he wanted nothing more than to sit in the lap of Kali, Nivedita was appalled and even called the doctor. He wanted to experience the non-self of becoming one with the mother. But she did not understand that it allowed him to shed the hyperactivity that had distinguished him as America's cyclonic monk. This momentary relinquishing of plans and power enabled him to find the detachment he needed to re-enter the fray. By returning to babyhood, by going into the lap of Kali, he reclaimed unworldliness before re-engaging. And I will end by saying he showed his radical edge to his Western acolytes who didn't always understand. When visiting the dungeon cages of Mont Saint-Michel in Normandy, 
And I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but you can see it's an island uh, um, where the tide comes in and goes out. And it's a place where you really are imprisoned. <laughs> and when he saw it, he muttered under his breath, what a wonderful place to meditate. These prison cells had contained the political prisoners under the Bourbon absolutism and continued to function until the 1860s. He advocated the marshalling of vital energy against tyranny and revealed how the deepest renunciation could also encompass the highest activism. When Aurobindo awaited, tri awaited trial in 1908 in prison, he saw Vivekananda in a vision and urged his comrades to form a yogic form to follow a yogic form of revolutionary asceticism, a new kind of lila or divine play that entails self-control, moral strength, and physical endurance. They became Krishna in the prison house. What is so interesting is that he used the middle way to urge his hearers away from extremes, but at certain moments, the militant edge remained. This explains why, over a generation ago, people, especially in Bengal, came to Vivekananda as socialists on the left. And today, he also inspires the more radical on the right. For all these reasons, Vivekananda is truly a movable feast, provocative, undoubtedly significant, but infinitely faceted. Because he died at 39, we can never truly know what his future course might have been. Thank you very much. <laughs>